This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Absolutely. Yes, there is life after statehood. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'll be the host today, even though it's kind of Ray's program, Ray Tsuchiyama, he'll be my, my guest, because we're going to talk about something that has been remarkable since statehood, roads and traffic in Hawaii. We're going to compare, and we're going to ask the question is, how have we been keeping up? Are, are we keeping up with roads and traffic here? Welcome to your show, Ray. Thank you for having me and, and me to kind of have myself. And as you know, state who was going to be the uh, best of all possible worlds after the territory of Hawaii, where people look back and say it was the worst of all possible worlds in, in some ways. And, and now, of course, we're living in a situation, 2018, where it, people are maybe um, it, uh, have become numb to traffic or, or just to take it for granted. That is the new, I hate to say this, normal. Yeah. So how, how did it begin? I mean, you have rich memories of life on Maui. I have memories, too, when I arrived here in 1965. It's a lot different about cars then. How was it as you grew up on well, Maui? Well, no, 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 I didn't grow up in Maui. I lived there recently, but I grew up in Kalihi. Uh, and, and, and around the same time that you arrived, I, I arrived also in Kalihi. Okay, okay, grew up okay. There. And, uh, of course, uh, as we spoke before, Honolulu was much more neighborhood-centric. And, in fact, uh, Kalihi, where I grew up, was a very unique uh, area. And it's a very dense area. There's 42, currently 42,000 residents of the census tract called Kalihi Palama. That's a lot of people. But even back then, uh, the uh, lands beyond Red Hill were, to me, pockets of like little towns and communities. Aea, Waipahu, Wahewa, way out to Nanakuni. Each one was another small plantation. That's right. Uh, that's right. Uh, or the ending of plantations of that point. Uh, there were, uh, and uh, ag was still, uh, still going strong. Do pineapple and sugar were still uh, being harvested in the central uh, Oahu. But downtown Oahu was very concentrated. And, but remember, uh, Waikiki was just getting started. Uh, there was the Ilikai, the Moana, and, and Royal Hawaiian, and Halikulani, and, and, and some new uh, smaller hotels for the middle class uh, tourists to come. And of course, downtown was where everything was happening. Downtown was the retail you know, center, but there were other localized places like, uh, of all places, Kaimuki, Wailai Avenue, was a bustling uh, place. And there were strips of, uh, of businesses along Baritania Street and King Street. And then one day, it became uh, both from two-way streets to one-way streets. And that wrecked uh, retail. In yeah, isn't that funny? I mean, it was for traffic purposes. That's right. When you talk about but traffic. But it wrecked retail all That's right. around the central business. And of course, the other one that really uh, uh, everybody believed in statehood planning to alleviate traffic was H1. <laughs> and that was to bring people in and out of the central core uh, to, uh, and of course what that happened is that it, it unleashed uh, uh, development uh, out there beyond Red Hill. But, for, but when you look at uh, H1 and uh, take a look as you're going down H1 towards uh, Waikiki, how the on and off ramps are designed. Okay. They're, they're all compromises. There, there's a lot of places where people are getting on, where people are trying to get off. Yeah. Okay. And on the, on the mainland, you don't see that that often. It's a very convoluted, very short, uh, narrow and That goes place. to a fundamental point, a legal point about Hawaii. <clears throat> As I learned early on when I was working for the government here, um, Hawaii doesn't like condemnation. <laughs> oh, no, really? I yeah, can tell right, you stories. Right, right. Nobody wants to condemn land for government projects. Right. And so the result is they don't. If they can't make a deal with the owner um, that works for both sides, they don't make a deal and they don't condemn. Result is you get the freeway. Right. The freeway is a perfect example of that. They didn't want to condemn the ramps in and the ramps <laughs> off, okay, so that you have this really odd design around the freeway. It never worked then and it doesn't work now. And it's because they didn't condemn the land they needed to condemn to make those ramps work. And this is not only around the freeway, it's really in many other places in the state. 
Now, why don't we have traffic circles? Because we don't want to condemn the land. Well, again, why don't we build new roads that will allow new access, such as in uh, you know, the New Uwanu area, where there's only one access in and out? We should condemn land and build new roads to improve the access. We don't do that. I, I think um, you have a very good point, but uh, places like Singapore and other places that really uh, transform communities, they, uh, they provide a very uh, good, positive alternative, an option, so that you could live in a better place or have a different... Uh, I, I think the state doesn't offer uh, those a menu of very good options. So what you do is just hang on to what you have as much as possible. And, and so there's none of that great changes or transformations. Right now, the most transformational place that you, they're trying to create a very artificial neighborhood where people can live, work, and play in the same area is Kakako. Right. But it's artificial. <laughs> right. It never happened. Well, it did happen before. It happened in the old days, as you described. You know, down Iea right, right. and uh, Pearl City right. and Waipahu, the, the three, you know, plantation towns where you stayed right. in the one town. And this was repeated on the neighbor islands. Right. Look at Hamakua, look at Maui, um, where you stayed in the same town. You, you didn't need a car. You didn't have a car back in the plantation days. You just lived your life no, in the plantation No, you have a very town. good point. Uh, I said uh, before that my uh, father grew up at Poonana Camp, had 11,000 uh, residents, and uh, Ma the total of Maui was barely 45,000. Uh, 45, uh, 45, so so um, I think what you're saying is that in the history of Hawaii, there were many artificial towns uh, that were made for living, working, company, uh, company retail. Towns, yeah. Right. And, uh, and for a lot of people, strangely enough, they have very good memories. And when you talk to people about the plantation, they don't talk about how bad things were. I think most times they would tell you how everybody was the uncle or aunt to you. Uh, no doors were uh, locked. So which is right, Ray? Which is right? Were the plantations really kind of an Elysian Fields kind of place where everybody was happy? I th were the I think, plantations really a, a, a sort of a self-deception? I think there's, um, uh, I think there's, it's both. Okay? And, but you add another, because compared to what, okay? Compared to the life my grandparents had in Japan, wow, it's so much better when you think about it. <laughs> or China, or, you know, or, or the Philippines, wow. You have uh, running water, you have bathrooms, you have a, and, and, and food, and you know, all kinds of things um, that you didn't have an oppressive uh, police uh, you know, kind of thing. Of course, there were judges and police that were really self-contained, uh, especially on the neighbor islands. The thing that really um, took people out and began to transfer their minds was education, public education. During the 20s and 30s, Territory of Hawaii education was very good uh, for, the, for the children who could go. Uh, to, um, they were teaching Latin in Maui. That's right. Maui High School had Latin, had proms, had Julius Caesar. My father's best friend was called Cassius. <laughs> I mean, and, 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 <laughs> That's where it came from. And they <laughs> began to uh, uh, pursue cars. Everybody had a license. Everybody tried to get a car. People get, uh, go to proms in a car, go to a driving in a car. It, it really, in the pre-war period, uh, it was very technologically aware society, I think. You see, people look at uh, the, uh, the plantation society as a very static, immobile society. I see the beginnings of malls and, and, and a transition towards uh, suburbs. As much as California, but this was happening on the mainland too. Yeah. It was, it was all that period of the 30s where everybody worshipped the car. Every kid had to learn how to take, take apart the Model That's C right. and put it back together yeah. again. Uh, and, and we were, Hawaii was trying to emulate, I think, what was going on. Exactly. And they did a good job in those days. Yeah. Everybody knew about the car. Then I remember, just a short story, and this is not, not in the 30s, but it, it tells you the story. So we, I once represented a trustee of a, of a trust fund that had unlimited amounts of money to give to certain beneficiaries. And one beneficiary, they said to him, look, you're graduating high school. We'll send you to any college on the mainland you want. Name it. And we'll fund everything about this college. And, and the beneficiary said, I don't, I don't want to go to college. I want to go to automobile mechanic repair school um, overnight, you know, with the dormitory and everything somewhere in Arizona, or I think it was. And um, that's what I really care about because that's, that's what I want to put my career into, auto mechanics. 
And this is fairly recently. I right. think well, that there's yeah. a culture point that right. came out of the 30s right. where people worship the oh, car. Yeah. They'd rather do that than, than, than go to a four-year college. And I think that still exists today. And the trustee said, are you serious? You re I give you everything and you want to go study one? Yep, that's what I want to do. And he went there. Wow. And, the, and, and up till, I think, the 60s, there were schools uh, for mechanics and engineers sponsored by GMs and Fords in Detroit. And that's where my father went be right before the war. That was the mecca of, of auto engineering in the world, when you think about it. So now fast forward to after the war. Fast forward to a time when uh, people were coming off the plantations, I guess that's the 50s, the 60s, uh, to a time where they had some disposable income. Um, now they're buying cars like hotcakes. Automobile dealers are here in right. force, right. and they're selling <clears throat> cars like hotcakes. Very profitable right. business in those days. And people are, you know, I mean, all of a sudden, they never had a car before. Now they have a car. Right. Now their wife has a car. Right. Now their kids have a car. Right. Now four people in the family, all four of them have a right. car. Um, so, and that's where we are today. In fact, it might be five or six cars in that four person. And they need a garage, and the only way to get a large place with a garage is out in the Kapolei area or <laughs> in, in the western suburbs. And yeah. all this is a burden on the infrastructure, right. on whatever that freeway turned out to be, however many ramps on or off, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, on the roads, whether they had traffic circles or not, whether they had uh, modern timed lights or you know, signal, signal technology on the roads, uh, whether they were one way or right. two ways or whatever. It didn't matter. It what, doesn't it matter because they couldn't handle the number okay. of cars. <laughs> what do we do about that? What did we do about that? Say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, since that time, I mean, Neil Blaisdell, uh, in an apocryphal story, held up the uh, map of uh, Manhattan, north-south, and he put it this way, and this, that's Oahu. That's 1967, Very before Fosse came. Very interesting. And there must have been people from Hawaii must have gone to the Tokyo Olympics of 64 and rode in a monorail from Haneda Airport to Hamamatsucho in, in Tokyo. They must have seen it at that time, but they didn't bring it back for some reason or another. That would have been the beginnings of mass transit back yeah, in yeah. the mid 60s. That would have trans transformed Hawaii. But Neil Blaisdell thought about it even back then. He was thinking of, and pe so that tells you that uh, that congestion was becoming a problem back in the late 60s. When I first started practicing law here um, in 1971, we would, we, would get, we would hop in one of the partner's cars, we would drive to Kaimuki, we would have a big lunch with the, the partner and three or four <laughs> right. associates, and then we'd come back, and all of that was like in 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Try that today. <laughs> right, right. Right. You know, and, and really, I mean, I, don't, I really don't think that the city has put any significant money or planning into organizing and re reorganizing the roads or the traffic systems so that uh, you have too many cars on an aging and um, you know not an updated system and it gets worse and worse and then you have and I and I would like to discuss this with you Ray you have what I call a flash jam which nobody can predict or at least right without a computer nobody can predict when or where it's going to happen and how deadly it's going to be, and you're going to a place where you thought you could get there X period of time, you left yourself yeah, right, plenty of right, room, and all right. of a sudden, bang, right. flash jam, for no good reason. And, and you would think that on, in the 21st century, living today with the Google, Facebook, Amazon, AI, artificial intelligence, that we could have algorithms that would change the lights and everything and channel people and, and this is more open, so it sends you little mobile text, and it would be so automatic that you know that it would uh, be uh, prearranged uh, how how you get to, uh, from place to place. So you would think that, but I don't think anybody is really placing any research. No, what, on it, this. what interests me is uh, is you know you watch television in the morning and they say, oh, this one's crowded and right. the traffic <laughs> right, is really right, right, bad right. over here. It's an accident over right, there. Right. But you don't have options. It's, it's not like it's, you can't do anything no, no. about that. You can't go around there. No, no, that's you, the only so way you can go informational. in. It's informational. That's right. It's so suffer. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, you know, so you ask the city, what are you doing about it? We built this really expensive, brand new traffic observation center where we know how the traffic is doing at all points around Oahu. Okay? What does the traffic observation center do to actually control the traffic around? Oh, we don't do that. <laughs> We watch. It's right. informational. Right. It's all right. informational. 
And it's part of this thing about, you know, lay back and enjoy it. <laughs> it's the new normal. Yeah. Uh, it's the way things are, you know, suffer through it. Um, what's that word in Japanese? Uh, it means have, have, have... Gamon. 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 It was in yeah. the Allegiance uh, play, right? <laughs> Gamon. So everybody sits there on the highway, right. come on. You have to suffer. You have to yeah, suffer. suffer. And, silence. Suffer. Silence. Silence. and you, yeah. know, you, you, you spend two hours a day or more, three hours a day uh, you know, uh, uh, commuting and uh, come on. Yeah. And, and really, we have forgotten how to, how to try to get government to do something. We have given up on trying to get a better, a better arrangement. And government, you know, through, through our giving up, they give up. Government's not doing anything either. There have been all these plans over the years, but mm, nothing right now. And uh, I, I, after this break, Ray, okay. can we spend yeah. a little time right. um, coming to some kind of suggestions about what could happen to improve this and that possibilities flood your mind? Right. We'll come right back. Okay. みなさんこんにちは。ThinkTechHawaiが日本語でお届けするこんにちはハワイの日本語放送のホスト国末ゆかりです。各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています。日本語コミュニティハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報、ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組です。こんにちはハワイ。各週の月曜日2時からぜひ皆さん見て
happen on this, you, you're at a higher level. That's number one. Number two, there's what we talked about great incentives or disincentives. And incentives in a way of what can you do to legislate, it brings you great advantages, taxes or money or to buy an EV, for example, or not to buy a car or you know, go on bicycles and all that. That's number one. Or have great disincentives, which is you know, how to make a car's price so high that you can't afford it. Or gasoline prices so high, eight to nine dollars a gallon, which is in Japan and many European uh, countries, and people don't are not riding the streets except in France right now. <laughs> but in Japan, they're not riding because they have great options for mass transit. That's what you have to give them. Yeah. You have to you make one option less attractive and another option right. more attractive. Now you have changed public conduct. We we don't know how to do that. We have to learn how to do that. So yes, you make gas more expensive. Right. You make cars more expensive. You limit the number of cars and you require some kind of payment to the government on every new car beyond, you know, you can set it up so that it becomes expensive. They can say that's regressive. On the other hand, it's not really regressive if you're offering alternatives. Right. The alternatives exactly. would put a lot of exactly. money into buses. Yes. Ray, make buses free. That, why, free. Haven't, why haven't I seen that? <laughs> I, I, don't I, I don't understand it. that either. Because I think the city treats the, the bus as a profit center or something well, when they shouldn't be. But interesting when you say that because one of the uh, legacies of the Frank Foster administration were uh, bus, the bus and parks. I mean, and efficiency. When you look at the city then, I, uh, the city has changed for me. There's a lot more like areas uh, near city parks or, or, uh, or uh, sidewalks. There's grass growing and it looks bad. It, it's, it's bad. But it, it was a much more efficient city under, uh, under Fossey. But the bus, you're correct. And, and when you think about a re reaction against, uh, uh, strangely against a bus in the 80s, was that a lot of Japanese tourists didn't know how to use the bus. Okay? Who has two dollars and fifty seventy-five cents and change when you think about it? Okay, <laughs> how do you know uh, what the bus driver is telling you in English? How to get from Waikiki to downtown? You have no idea. Uh, you can't read it. So that's how the development of an independent parallel bus uh, system uh, developed. Uh, the Lea Lea, the you know, and Oli Oli, and all these open uh, buses that pick up seemingly only Japanese tourists. That's a kind of a parallel system that they developed. Because the Japanese didn't like to ride the regular system. Well, I don't think, you know, no, they, they I don't like, like to ride the regular yeah, system either. I, I think it can be much better. Yeah, of course, it is, uh, there's many things to improve, but uh, it, it, why put more buses when you can have, you know, one bus uh, system? Good right? point. Yeah, but, but anyway, uh, th th that was an interesting imp impetus uh, for that because there are still a lot of people who do not have a car from Waikiki would like to travel out for, for you know, short rides and to. Uh, ward or, or near downtown. So th that's another, another area. Uh, but the larger, more uh, sustained uh, 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 propagandizing of people about the uh, culture of cars and the worship of cars has to start maybe in kindergarten. And consistently through and reinforced every year, cars are bad. <laughs> Take a bicycle, walk. Uh, take the bus. I mean, all these things have to be like uh, in the minds of children. So they, when they graduate, they have a much more sustainable view of the world. Yeah, and voters and the legislature. The legislature could solve this problem in one stroke. The city council could solve it in one stroke. They don't do anything. Um, and I mean, it's just as bad on the neighbor islands. There's a ter terrific traffic jams on the neighbor islands. Oh, there's uh, even uh, fewer buses and, and a far uh, uh, comprehensive bus service on the, on the neighbor islands. You're absolutely right. So it's absolutely necessary to have, more, uh, to have a car. In fact, there are probably more cars per capita per family on Maui or uh, Island Hawaii or, or Kauai than on Oahu. The pro problem is harder on the neighbor islands yeah. because you have to have more buses to cover all that distance. Back in the day, I'm talking about two or three terms ago, uh, the term before Billy Kanoi, um, the buses were free oh, from right. Hilo to Kona wow. for all the hotel workers. Right, of course. Free. Of course. This was such a wonderful yeah, thing yeah. for everybody. And people don't realize how important it is to have free buses. Yeah. In Melbourne, Australia, they have free buses in the central central business right, right, district. Right. And it has made the place come alive. I would ride a free bus and it, if it was free, I would just get on and sure, get off and short sure. hops all around downtown Waikiki. It would make my life much more easier. So yes, we'll have to spend money for that, but think of the enormous change we would have. Um, and and it, it, it would change everything. 
Um, and it would, um, gee, I, I, it would make rail less important, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's another area. So it's another area. Anyway, it sounds like incentives, disincentives, and the big incentives is the bus offering an alternative to people here and on the neighbor islands. Uh, very important things to have to do. Somebody has to address this. It's not informational. It's not demon. It's actually doing things. <laughs> That's right, uh, because you have to have a strategy and a plan. You know, where do you want to go? And I mean, this is so silly to mention, but is there a numerical target? Is there a maximum? This is the last car you can point. buy. Tipping point. Yeah, because the, after this, you have to uh, pay $5,000 per car that, as a tax or, you know, uh, or something at the year 2025. You know, we talk about renewable energy. We're not going to get there or whatever, 2050. But there has to be some kind of a line in the sand or some number that people say, this is 700,000 cars for this little island. That's the end. You know, we cannot have more. Yeah. And then, uh, but, uh, but you see, uh, what I told you about, uh, about toothpaste or detergent, you can make it only for the people on Oahu. People will smuggle cars. People will do anything to bring other... Because uh, the culture is so invested oh, in cars. They would do People anything. will spend any percentage oh, of their income to do it. That's right. It doesn't matter what gas costs. They're so, going to so spend the money. So again, it's back to the mind, I think. It really has to do with the mind. Even the taxes, people will, yeah, will, like you say, borrow or sell their grandmother or whatever for, for money to buy a car. And then, uh, I, I don't know. It, it, it's something that... Um, uh, the plan obsolescence and so forth uh, uh, is part of it, but this branding of yourself, your identity, is, is like um, synonymous with a car. Yeah, we're still working on that. We're working on that in many ways about climate change too, sea level rise, but we have to demonstrate to ourselves and the world that we're able to solve this problem. Otherwise, we will be uh, backwater. And this is one of the most visible things that happen when people come off and, uh, the plane and they see the, they see the traffic jams, they see the potholes, um, they see how tough it is to get around. We have to fix this. It affects all of us. It affects our economy. So thanks for those suggestions, Ray. This is a great subject. Anytime. Uh, you know, all the people who founded the state, Patsy Nick, uh, John Burns, uh, you know, all the, didn't want this to happen. They, they wanted a very efficient society. Uh, for all people, for all people, you know, they, they didn't want an unequal society. They wanted an equal society and, and one that would be, again, very efficient and, and uh, very community-based. But now we're in a crazy uh, time, I think, and uh, we, we maybe it's more of the same. Every year it's more of the same, and we have to draw a line someplace in the future. This, this is it. We just yeah. have to work for, at this goal uh, that we are seeing for cars. Yeah. Well, we have, we have to address it. And to answer the question, have we kept up? Answer, no. <laughs> we have sort of forgotten our, our, our goal to keep up. But right. now through this kind of discussion, which I hope we can do again, we will remember and maybe they will too. Okay. Thank you, Thank Ray. You. Thank Ray you. Tuchiyama. Okay. <laughs>